<laughs> and with that, um, thank you all again for being here tonight. Um, I am really pleased to introduce Dr. Wendy Perrier from the Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. We're going to be hearing tonight about updates to the highly pathogenic avian influenza, or, or HPAI, and Wendy's research. So with that, take it away, Wendy. Thank you so much. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. And I am honored to be here to be able to talk to everybody about the work that, uh, that we've been doing with high path avian influenza and hopefully give you a little bit more of an overview of, of what exactly it is and why we might care. Um, share my screen here. All right, so hopefully you can now see my slides. All right, so the, the inception of this seminar series was a science pub and actually occurred um, in a very informal way in a, in a bar or a restaurant um, and is meant to be really a, a, an informal discussion about just some cool science that's going on. Uh, so what I'm gonna be talking to you about tonight is it kind of spans hopefully a, a bunch of different um, different aspects that will have a little bit of interest for everybody because I'm guessing the audience probably includes some people that are very familiar with looking at genetic sequences of viruses and haven't thought a whole lot maybe about wildlife. Maybe some people who are very well versed um, and experts in wildlife maybe haven't thought so much about viruses. And um, perhaps some people that are general science enthusiasts and are, are here to, to learn something new about a topic that is entirely novel um, to some of you here tonight. So. Hopefully we'll touch on some levels that are of interest for everyone. And uh, I have my email address up here so that if there's something that you wish I had discussed more or had explained better, or um, it just kind of gets the wheels turning and you have something that you'd really like to, to follow up and have a discussion about, please do not hesitate to, to reach out uh, and contact me there at wendy.perrier at tufts.edu. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, have some further conversations. All right, so with that, we're talking about high pathogenicity avian influenza, and that often gets abbreviated as HPAI, and that's how you'll see it for most of the discussion tonight. And looking from the global scene to the local view. So first we're just going to start with a, a crash course on influenza and make sure that we're all um, at least starting with the same general foundation in discussions about influenza. And then we will go into dis a discussion about the origin of the current HPAI that is circulating and the, the reason for this talk tonight. Then we're going to discuss uh, a little more detail about HPAI in birds in the Northeast and dive a little further into the work that we have done here regionally, um, much of which has included Nantucket and the islands. And then transition over to talking about HPAI transmission in mammals. And then finally wrap up with a discussion about questions that are still remaining and research directions that are, are still being pursued and are things that are, are outstanding. All right, so first for your crash course on influenza. Start with what is influenza? Uh, and as Sarah was kind of referencing in, at the beginning, all of us have some sort of familiarity in various levels with influenza, whether you have personally had it, or you, I'm sure everybody knows people who have had it, we, we know what influenza is in a very broad sense. Uh, but often when we think about influenza, we think about it in terms of how it is impacting humans. And actually a lot of people don't even realize that animals have influenza. It's, it's not just a human infection. So there is the, what we think of as seasonal influenza, and that is primarily, um, they're defined as H1N1 and H3N2. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what exactly those numbers mean. But that's the seasonal flu that we think of as, as humans having. And then the one that we're hearing a lot about in the news these days is the so-called bird flu or high path avian influenza or H5N1, it goes by many names. Uh, but that is another one that, that really is just scratching the, the tip of the iceberg. So even just thinking about these ones, the H1N1, H3N2, H5N1, they all fall within influenza A virus. And there's a large group of variants of influenza A, of which these are just a few of them. 
So in fact, there are um, approximately 144 different subtypes of influenza that, that are known or thought to exist in wild animals, primarily in birds. And when we're talking about these H's and these N's, and what does that really mean? If you look in a picture of a virus here, it's studded with these proteins on the outside of it, it's like kind of like Velcro. And those proteins are made up of two viral pieces, the hemagglutinin, or the H, and the neuraminidase, or the N. The hemagglutinin, there are 16 different ones that we know about in birds. And there are nine different neuraminidases that we know about in birds. And how those come together is how we then name the variant of influenza. So the hemagglutinin one and the neuraminidase one, H1N1, that's one of the seasonal human influenzas. H5N1, that's the so-called bird flu. Now, one of the really uh, handy tricks that influenza has up its sleeve is that its genome, unlike us, its genome is actually segmented on eight different pieces. So that means that it can take these, and here I'm showing you a, a yellow version of influenza and a blue version of influenza. It can take those eight different segments and it can actually switch and swap them around and make new variants of influenza. So that's where you get these big reassortants that can happen and this big shift that can occur in the, the form of the virus that is circulating. And in some cases, if you have a shift that's uh, dramatic enough, that really uh, kind of wreaks havoc for the immune system. Because if you think about what, what our bodies have been trained to see, what our immune system has been trained to see, if you suddenly shift a big piece of that that had been circulating in a bird that we had never seen, it's throwing a monkey wrench into things for our immune system. So these are things that we pay very close attention to of how these viruses can reassort and what ones then may be able to shift from one species to another, bringing in pieces that that species had potentially not seen before from, a, from an immune perspective. All right, so let's take all of those hemagglutinins and all of those neuromonidases. And I need to apologize that I, I really talk with my hands <laughs> and I would be much better suited if we were actually in a pub and you could see. So bear with me as you're seeing my hands flash by. So if you've got all the hem hemagglutinins along the top and all the neuromonidases, and we can start to fill in the different combinations that we know exist. So as I mentioned, I'm showing here in yellow, you've got the H1N1, there's an H2N2 and an H3N2. Those are the ones that have been associated with human infections as far as ones that circulate in the human population. Well, meanwhile, there are all these other combinations that I've shown in green that have been confirmed to be in birds. So when I was saying that that what we have is the tip of the ice cream, uh, iceberg, I, I really mean it. There's just uh, you know, all these different variations that exist out there. So H2N2, I'm kind of shading out a little bit because that one no longer circulates. So really we're down to H1N1 and H3N2 that circulate in humans. But now if we focus in that, on that H5N1, that's that high path avian influenza. And that's the one that we, um, are hearing a lot about perhaps in the media, and that's what the focus is of the research that I'm talking about today. So the H5N1 is described as a high path avian influenza. Now, what exactly does that mean, high path avian influenza? Because it makes it sound very scary. So it's important to realize that high path versus low path, the vast majority of influenza variants, influenza A variants, are low path avian influenza. High path is really just defined from a very agricultural focused perspective. So does that form of influenza cause a high amount of morbidity and mortality when it goes into poultry? Does it kill chickens? That is ultimately the definition of high path avian influenza. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's high path for other species. It's defined based on how it impacts poultry. Generally, high path influenza originates in farmed birds, uh, but there, there are some changes that are associated with it, some genetic changes that make it uh, more prone to being able to infect mammals. So that's where we start to think about the potential for it to have adaptations that could lead to pandemic potential. 
So if you think again about that whole slew of green I was showing you of all the different variants that are out there, you have some that have some that are in birds. If you have some that have these changes that happen that allow it to be better adept at infecting a human or, or a mammal, then we need to worry perhaps more for what that means for human health as well. So that is another reason we pay close attention to high path influenza. So I definitely don't want to downplay the impact of high path and the fact that it impacts poultry because this is a huge issue. Um, this is looking at just over this last year from high path coming into North America, the economic impact that it has had and the, the impact that it can have on food security. So what I'm showing you here, um, the map is really just highlighting the green uh, highlights are for backyard flocks. So the numbers are there for both commercial flocks and backyard flocks. Of how many flocks across the US have been impacted by high path influenza. And it has hit almost all of the states, uh, 47 out of 50 where it's been confirmed. We're just shy of 60 million birds of poultry, of, of domestic birds that have been impacted by high path influenza in the US over the last year. So that's not even talking about wildlife yet. That's talking about commercial poultry, backyard poultry. And perhaps, <laughs> has anybody noticed the price of eggs lately? So uh, this also ties into that because the impact of the, the flocks has primarily hit the, the layers. So eggs have been uh, hit quite dramatically and prices have just skyrocketed over the last year, thanks to high path influenza. If you're wondering what's going on with the grocery store, that's that. So despite the fact that influenza, high path influenza in poultry is incredibly important, that's not what we're focusing on today. So we're talking about wildlife. And there are numerous species beyond humans and beyond poultry that are impacted by influenza. So wild birds are considered to be the reservoir host. And that means, again, that whole green sea of different variations that I showed as possibilities, those are circulating out there in wild birds, primarily waterfowl. And there's that tip of the iceberg that show up in uh, domestic animals, birds and mammals. So we also end up having uh, spillovers that happen in swine. And there's a, a whole several more talks worth of stuff that go on between uh, poultry and swine, but that's a discussion for another day. And then there are the variants that also can spill over into mammals in the wild. So a lot of the work that we do, um, and I think several people probably on this call have been involved in in some of the work of looking at seals, marine mammals. So marine mammals are definitely something that we keep a clo close eye on in terms of influenza of what's circulating out there in the wild. But there are all these other species. There's equine, there's canine, there's um, even seen a panda. This is just a whole range of different species that can get influenza. All right, so that's your crash course and just getting up to speed on influenza in general. But now to focus in on the current high path influenza that is circulating um, in the region, but throughout the country and throughout the globe. Uh, so really, it, this is a, a global issue that is going on right now. But I wanted to point out that this is not a new issue specifically. Uh, this form of the ancestor of this form of influenza has been around for a while. After the last couple of years of living in a pandemic, whether or not we all like it, we have all become much better versed at thinking about variants of virus. So what I'm showing you here is not, not that dissimilar from what we've all kind of been forced to learn about COVID, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. And if you think about when we started off, you had alpha and beta, delta and omicron, we all have sort of an intuition now of knowing that those are slightly different forms of the virus, but they're all still the virus that causes COVID. It's the same sort of thing that I'm showing you here. So these different colors are showing you different variations of what is ultimately the same virus. So these are all high path avian influenza, but they've, they've shifted and, and changed a little bit over the years. So each of the dots that is on here represents, each of the dots represents a virus sequence. And here is showing you the passage of time. 
So it was back in 1996 that the ancestor of the virus that is currently circulating as high path avian influenza uh, was first detected in domestic poultry. And it pretty much stayed in domestic poultry for a while. It wasn't until almost about 10 years later that it first was detected to have spilled over into waterfowl. So now it's kind of made it out of the barnyard and it's into the wild animals. But it still was pretty well contained uh, for, for quite a while. And it continued to evolve and adapt and reassort and changes occurred and time passed until eventually in 2014, it made it into migratory aquatic birds and started to, to make its way around the globe. In 2014, we actually had an ancestor of this, this form of high path influenza made its way into North America. It came in through Alaska, through the Pacific. And we had a, a pretty robust outbreak within, um, within poultry during that time period as well. But it was pretty transient. So it impacted the domestic birds and we didn't see very much in wild birds. There were some, but it was nothing like what we have going on right now. So the first, for the most part, it came in it caused a problem in, in commercial poultry, but it was um, it was stamped out and that was it. We haven't seen it again. Meanwhile, it did continue to circulate in the globe and largely there was a, largely in Europe continued to have this virus circulating over there um, for the last 10 years or so. And then it was in late 21 that the latest version of this virus made its way across the Atlantic and came in um, it seems to be that it came in from gulls into the North Atlantic and just spread like wildfire from there. So now we're out here in this cluster of virus. It's continued to circulate in Europe, but this is the version of the virus that has landed in North America as of about a year ago. So once it came in and it landed, it did not take very long for it to spread. Uh, we thought it would be a little bit more of a gradual advancement across the continent, but it very quickly, so it landed November, December, and then went down the flyway, down the Atlantic quite quickly. So this data point, uh, this graph was from March, and it's showing where commercial poultry in red, uh, backyard flocks in yellow, and wild birds in green, where animals were detected to have high path. And it's important to realize that each of these dots doesn't represent a single case. If there is a flock of you know, a, a thousand animals, it's represented as a single dot. So this is just showing you the locations, not the absolute numbers. But it didn't take very long before it went down the Atlantic and then across North America, up into Alaska, down into Florida, really covered the entire uh, US and up through Canada. And at this point, it really is kind of running rampant around the globe. And it's not represented on this map because I think this was from October when this was last updated, but uh, it's now been detected down in South America. There's been large die-offs of pelicans um, in Peru. So it is, has also gone down into the, the Southern hemisphere as well and continues to circulate here as well as, as other places uh, like I said around the globe. All right, so now we're gonna bring it back in and focus a little bit more closely on what has been happening in the Northeast with high path influenza. So focusing back in on our little neck of the woods, but keeping in mind that this is a global issue, but bringing in that, that lens a little bit closer to home. So it was pretty early on, we knew, um, you know, late December, early January of 22, we knew that that it had landed here on our on our doorstep and was likely going to um, explode into a, a pretty sizable problem. And sure enough, we started to see that pretty quickly. So we immediately started working um, with several wildlife clinics, several of which are um, on Nantucket and the Cape and Tufts Wildlife, um, and have formed great partnerships to be able to see what is going on in as close to real time as possible to understand what species are being impacted and how is it moving through our ecosystem. We then pretty quickly uh, expanded these collaborations and expanded these networks and have had these fantastic partnerships with a number of different groups from all up and down the Atlantic coast uh, and other parts of the country as well, but we're focusing on the Atlantic for now, uh, all up and down the coast of groups that are going out and doing 
uh, work on the colonies and doing field work, but also people who are uh, from various different state agencies and rehabilitators and all sorts of people who, who care and interact with wildlife were able to partner with us to look and see whether or not high path influenza was impacting the species here in our region. And we, we very quickly realized that, that we had a lot going on. So there were, uh, so this is data that ends, uh, we've kind of drew a line in the sand for what's being presented here at the end of July. We had a brief little lull there uh, coming into late summer. So this was um, over a thousand birds that were, were screened, 78 different species, and found 119 of those that we were able to confirm had high path influenza. And that was representing 21 different species. And that's just from the data set that we screened from all these partnerships that are outlined here. 21 different species. And that's particularly noteworthy because when we think about high path influenza before this current form um, exploded onto the scene, it impacts, you have mortality, it impacts poultry, it impacts domestic birds. And you see it in ducks as kind of the natural reservoir, but rarely do you see any sort of pathology there. So the fact that we're seeing pathology in this huge range of species is, a, a completely different scenario than what we've seen with influenza in the past. It's also been the case that with very, very rare exceptions, almost all of the animals that have had high path influenza uh, that we've, we've seen as positive have had this really strong neurology um, and, and deceased. So it has been very severe to the animals that have been impacted by the virus. So here I'm just listing out um, some of the avian species that we've seen, uh, again, in partnership with, with everybody who has helped to, to gather these samples that we've seen here in our region that have been high path influenza. So there have been a lot of raptors, there have been um, a lot of seabirds, a lot of, a lot of different species of gulls and, and, um, and seabirds that are kind of intermingled on how they're listed here. There's no real rhyme or reason to how they're listed out there, but um, certainly, uh, a wide variety of species that we have seen. So also in the region, showing you the timing of how we saw this unfold um, kind of here in our backyard. So again, remember it came in uh, late 21, early 22. So already by, by late February, we're starting to see this peak come up in animals that we were detecting, so birds that we were detecting as high path influenza positive. And this first wave kind of came and went in throughout the spring. So we had this first wave of virus that came through March and April and things quieted down a little bit. And we thought maybe the spring migration was, was winding down and maybe we were out of the woods and this was gonna quiet down and that was that. Um, then we had this little, uh, quick increase that happened again with turns and another short little quiet period and then things spiked up again. So it definitely continued to, to stay in the region. We had another bit, so this timeline ends in August. We had another bit of a, a little bit of a lull sort of at the end of the fall migration and things are spiking up again. So it has not gone away. So over here on the map, also showing that the, uh, the locations of where we've detected the highest density of high path positive birds. And these individual dots are showing where there are um, bird colonies. So seabird colonies, largely primarily terns being worked with out through there, but where high path influenza was detected or suspected. In some cases, we weren't able to get confirmation of samples from those areas, but given the clinical signs that were being observed, it seems highly probable that that is what was going on in those spots. And then we have a lot of samples that came back as positive kind of around the Gulf of Maine here and lots coming off of the Cape. So we did see a little bit of a, a species breakdown in what was coming through as far as high path positive. The early wave was primarily uh, raptors and gulls. And then coming into that second little bump there in the summer, those were primarily terns. 
And then coming into the fall, it was primarily eiders, seabirds, and gulls that we were detecting as high path positive. All right, so this is where we start to go into the weeds if you're not used to looking at genetic sequence. And I promise it's not as painful as it looks here. There's some take home messages that we can pull off of this. And you don't need to worry about all those teeny tiny little uh, labels that are on there. So this is just showing you a bunch of different individual viruses uh, that were sampled off of animals. And really for the, the 10,000 foot view, the thing to keep in mind is that if things are clustered together, they are more similar than things that are not clustered together. So these are all pretty similar to each other. These are all pretty similar to each other. These are different from these. There's more nuance there that I'm happy to discuss further, but for tonight's purpose, that's, that's where we can go for that. So this is looking at other viruses that were detected in birds across North America. And that is the primarily the form of the virus that shows up across North America in the wild birds and going into poultry and reassorting and evolving. And that's the dominant form that has been seen uh, by other people kind of across the continent who are also looking at these things. We here in the Northeast are special. <laughs> we, have our, we have our own thing going on. So as it turns out, we have that form of the virus, but we also have our own unique form that really has not been seen outside of the Northeast, um, at least as far as I have heard from any sources. So shown here in yellow, this is a sequence that we pulled off of, of the birds from the first wave that went through. And we had the raptors and the gulls. And it's pretty much a, a slightly different variant that we are seeing in the Northeast. As we came into that second wave, we've got another new special thing going on. So we've got another slightly different variant. It's distinct from what we saw in that first wave and it's distinct from what has spread across the rest of North America. So we've got these that have pretty much stayed within this region and why is unclear. Um, there's also been, it's not shown on this map, there's also been another slightly different form that came in through Alaska and is sort of doing its thing over there. But then we have ours that came in here, it stayed here. And then there was that one with the big blue circle that came in and spread. All right, so just to recap what's going on in wild birds before we shift gears over to uh, expanding out into mammals. So the high path in wild birds, so just a reminder that it has been around since 1996, um, but it was fairly species limited. It started off in poultry, moved into some waterfowl, stayed there for a couple of decades before it changed and got to a point where it then expanded outside of its, its little niche and, and made this whole global situation that we currently have going on. So a variant moved into North America in late 21, um, and it's had devastating impacts on, on wild birds. Uh, several seabird colonies that have been hit very, very hard um, and continue to be not just in our region, but around the globe. And there seems to be a subvariant or some variants that are within the Northeast that are staying pretty well tucked around here um, and have just really decided, I guess, that they like our region and they don't feel the need to travel. So we've got our variants that are, that are here local. All right, so moving on to transmission of high path influenza into mammals. A lot of what we have seen with this has come down to what seems to be pretty clear predator-prey relationships. There have been, I've mentioned a few times now, there have been a lot of raptors that have come up positive for high path influenza. That seems to be pretty clear case of a bird going out eating another bird that was sick. Uh, and then in quite a few cases that have been documented bringing it back to the nest. And there have been cases where the whole nest dies or, or a subset therein, um, but it's been fairly well contained. So it's an animal that brings back an infected animal, ingests it, and that animal dies. Perhaps it gave it to its young, and its young may also die. Same sort of thing has happened. So that's an avian situation. That same sort of dynamic has happened with mammals. And that is something that has also been unique with this form of influenza. We, we typically don't see high path influenza 
getting really outside of poultry a whole lot, or it's asymptomatic in ducks, we don't see it causing a whole lot of problems in wild birds in general, and here it is causing problems in wild birds. We also don't see it causing problems in mammals, and here it is showing up in lots of mammals. So um, some of the first cases that started to show up were fox, and it was that same sort of situation as I'm describing with a raptor bringing it back to the nest, where a couple of kits would, from the same den, would have high path influenza, show neurological effects, and die. And that seems to, again, be a pretty clear demonstration of the parents bringing back to the, the offspring and the transmission happening through ingesting a sick animal. So at this point, there's been a pretty um, large number of, of mammals, of wild mammals that have been found to be positive for high path influenza. And that has been the case kind of across North America. And that's ranged from, um, well, here I'm just showing you, it goes across North America. And these colors here are corresponding to the different flyways. So it's not specifically staying within a given flyway, flyway where one species of bird is going, has gone across uh, the continent. But looking a little more closely at what some of the species have been. So just looking at terrestrial mammals, there have been over 110 different uh, infections that have been documented in terrestrial mammals. And again, these have been pretty focal. It's been a couple of fox here, a couple of opossum there. It hasn't been these big sort of outbreak scenarios where it seems like a, a whole region or a whole um, you know, cohort, a group of animals is having high path influenza. It seems like a few staggered all over the place are bringing back sick birds and getting infected through that through that mechanism. But it's ranged from um, the highest the highest number of mammal of terrestrial mammals that have been observed with high path influenza have been fox, opossum, and skunk. And then all of these other animals have also been um, confirmed to have high path influenza. Bear seem to be really coming onto the scene lately. There was first a black bear, and that was followed quickly by a report of a grizzly bear and a Kodiak bear. So we have a couple of different species of bear now that are showing um, influenza, high path influenza positive, as well as coyote and bobcat and mink and fisher and raccoon. Um, so again, there's there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence of spread within those species, but there. There has been a little bit of evidence of mammalian adaptation um, or hints that it might be starting to uh, acquire some of these adaptations that allow it to replicate, allow the virus to replicate better in mammals. All right, so all of those terrestrial animals that I was just showing you, that is a predator-prey relationship. It seems pretty clear that that's the transmission pathway that's happening there. We also know one of the reasons that we've been looking at seals for a long time now is we know that seals can get influenza and we know that it comes from birds. And as it turns out, when we think about influenza, we think of it as being a respiratory infection for us, right? But for birds, it is actually a GI infection. So the transmission is fecal oral. And that means that you've got a lot of sick birds or not, you've got a lot of infected birds that are shedding virus and they are shedding it fecally and we all know that bird feces can really be just about everywhere. And that provides the opportunity for a virus to be able to transmit into other species. And we've seen that happen with old path influenza with seals for a, a long time now. So as, the, as a bird is shedding virus, that can shed out into the water and that provides a source where virus can then uh, expose other animals or it can stay on the land and you can have this lovely coating of potentially viral laden fecal material for other animals to then go lay in and take naps and breathe in the virus that might be getting aerosolized there. So lots of opportunities for the virus to go from the feces of a bird into another animal. And we've known that that happens. The other thing about influenza is that it is actually able to uh, persist. It's able to survive for quite a while in the environment. And there are lots of different examples where live influenza virus has been recovered from, uh, from lakes, from ponds, from puddles, from rivers, from sewage, from drinking water, live virus that you can take it out and, 
and you can bring it into the lab and you can see that it still grows and still is capable of infection. It's also been possible to recover genetic material of virus, which it may or may not represent a live virus, but you can pull off the genetic material from all sorts of other environmental sources. Um, a lot of groups have gone in and looked in farms and those sorts of settings and you can pull it off of, of straw and dust and feeding bins and um, plants and pond sediment. So the virus definitely stays out there in the environment. And again, in a lot of these cases, it stays in a way that still allows it to be infectious. Under a perfect scenario, so if the water is cold and it's clean and you don't have um, you know, strong sun shining down on it for UV to break it down, under perfect scenarios for the virus, it can survive for quite a while. Um, we're talking a year or more if you go through a cycle of of a body of water freezing. You can still have live virus come back out after. It certainly can survive for hours to days to weeks, um, even in less hospitable conditions for the virus. So if we're talking about birds shedding virus into the environment, and let's talk about a, a body of water, conceptualize that it can stay in the water in infectious form for a period of time. We know that seals are able to, to find these freshwater sources. Uh, so this is actually um, an aerial view on Muskegon Island. I'm guessing most of this audience is fairly familiar with, but Muskegon Island is, is just off of Nantucket. And all of the circles here are circling seals where the ones in white are ones that are, are in the water. We can confirm they're in the water. And then all these ones in yellow are pups that are right up close to the water. So we, we know that they're getting into and close to the water. Of all the seal, so there have been, I, I mentioned before, there have been several cases of low path influenza that have made it into seals over the decades. Of all of the cases that have been documented and sequenced, all of them have traced back to wild birds. So it seems like this is certainly a, a viable way that that transmission cycle happens. So we can see from aerial footage that seals are getting in. We can also see when we're boots on the ground <laughs> that seals are in the water. Um, and this is perfectly timed from the reason we had to delay this talk. So we were just out on Monomoy and Milton got a great picture of what we have deemed pond pup. So sometimes we can actually see <laughs> that the seals are in little puddles of water and hanging out there for long periods of time and seem quite happy to bask in whatever fun juices might be going on from viruses being excreted from birds potentially. Uh, so again, it's definitely a possible way that virus can be transmitted. In addition to those environmental uh, transmission opportunities, there are also plenty of opportunities where the birds are in direct contact with seals as well. Um, so they get right up in the middle of the herd and they go around and, um, feed off of, they feed off of carcasses, they feed off of placenta after the pups are born. Um, and then we've also seen cases where seal pups are actually rolling around on dead birds out on the beach, like a, a puppy playing with a dead animal. So it's just happy as can be with a dead bird. So there, there are interactions that go in both directions. So all of this just is to say that we have this high amount of high path influenza in wild birds in the region. We know that the virus can survive in the environment. We know that low path influenza can go into seals. We've seen it for, for decades now. We know that there are these close interactions that happen between birds and seals. So it came as absolutely no surprise when high path influenza made it into the seal population here in our region um, this past summer. So we've got our, our reservoir hosts, we've got our susceptible species, we've got a shared habitat. All the pieces were there. So sure enough, uh, over June, primarily July, there was a, a spike in animals that were stranding and dying. This all occurred along the main coast. So all of these mortality events that ended up being attributed to high path influenza were in Maine. We didn't see anything show up further down along the Cape or further down the coast. Uh, we continue to monitor, but so far it has only been observed up in Maine. So this led to an unusual mortality event where we had a high number of seals uh, that were that were showing up sick or 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 dead. 
And again, if we just bring back to reorient to the what was going on with the, the wild birds in the region, and we had this first spike that came, and then we had the second wave that came. It was coinciding almost perfectly with this second wave that we saw in wild birds, showing you here in orange, where we saw the spike come up with high path influenza going in two seals in the region. And it spiked up pretty fast and steep, but it also it slowed down. I, I'm nervous to say it stopped, but it we haven't had anything uh, since the late July of a case showing up in a seal. All right, again, pulling us back into the, the big scary, there's way too much information on this slide, but you don't need to worry about all the details, except to bring us back in of trying to get an idea of what is happening with the virus when the seals and how that relates to the birds and what the connection is there. And again, just a reminder that if things are, are clustered together, that you know, broad strokes, that means that these are more similar than say these are to these. So in red are the viruses that came off of seal and black are the viruses that came off of birds. So, and this is that second wave where we saw that second wave come through in the eiders and the seabirds and the gulls. And that's when we saw, that's when we saw the seal infections spike up as well. So all of it was happening during this time frame, and all of it were these viruses that seem to be unique within our region. So we have these two separate clusters of slightly different versions of the virus. We have seals that had viruses that were up in, in the top cluster, and we had seals that had viruses that were down here in the bottom cluster. So both were represented. So the question that, that comes up again and again and again is, is transmission happening within mammals? Is it the case that seals are giving the virus to each other or any other mammal that, that I've talked about earlier as well? Is it happening within the mammals or is it all the case that birds are shedding virus like crazy and they're shedding virus at such a high level that they're infecting all of these animals independently and all of those infections are coming from birds, but mammals are not giving it to each other. So that is a really important question when we, when we want to think about the potential impact for human health and the potential impact for additional wildlife beyond birds. So the question is, is it coming from the bird to a seal or is it coming from a seal to a seal or any other mammal? One of the things that we've observed that has been a little bit different with seals that has been um, somewhat unique and suggests that perhaps there is something going on with transmission, a respiratory transmission instead of a GI, is that if we take and we sample from the animal, we're looking at samples to do swabs for virus from several different sites. So we're looking at nasal, we're looking at conjunctiva, we're the eye, uh, and we're looking at rectal. In some cases, we're looking at oral. And here I'm showing you all these individual seals that had high path influenza and the different biologic sites where we detected that virus. And in almost all cases, we're getting virus from the head. In a few cases, you get it from rectal, but they're pretty much all coming from the head. So this leads us to, to conclude that this might be more of a respiratory infection than what you're seeing with birds. That's a, a fecal oral, a GI infection, or with a lot of those other mammals where it's an ingesting and those animals are, are eating a sick animal. But how do we really address this question of looking at whether or not viruses are coming uh, all independently from birds or if they are transmitting within mammalian species? And really, it comes down to there's there's only so much you can do because we're not going to experimentally infect any animals. So you have to observe what is available and figure out your your strongest conclusion based on what's out there. So it kind of comes into this virus forensics sort of approach. The one thing we can do is we can say, okay, of all these seals that were positive, so we had a, a cluster of, of seals up here that had pretty similar virus those animals were all within about 10 miles of each other. We had another cluster that were all pretty similar. Those animals were all within about 30 miles of each other. 
we had these two seals that had viruses that were incredibly similar. Those actually came from the same exact town. So circumstantially, they are within range. You know, 10 miles isn't all that far as the seal swims. So they are within range that it could be transmitting. It's also possible that there were birds, that this bird was the one that had the virus and gave it to both of those seals. And this bird gave it to all those seals as it flew over. So it's, it's still possible it could be either scenario. We still can't really tell by looking at this. So one of the additional ways that we can try to get some information here is if you go into these ones that are very closely related, and again, pulling us down to the weeds, but you don't need to worry about all these details. We're looking at a few of the signatures of the genetics of the virus. And here we're looking at, um, just know that a different letter means that it's a change in the virus. So here we have the, the blue one represents birds from up here. The red one represents birds from down here. And then the two seals here on the end. So there are some places where you can see that the birds and the seals all have something that is different down in this cluster than this one. But that still doesn't tell us anything about where it came from. Just that there's something different from here than from here. But we already know that because they cluster differently. But if you look in on some of these other ones that I'm highlighting, there are some changes that are not present in the bird that only exist in the seals. So there are viruses, virus changes that are only there in those seal sequences. So that is a stronger form of evidence that those might have therefore transmitted within that species between the seals. But again, that's still very late on the data. We can't make any strong conclusions off of this. The best we can do right now. All right, so to summarize what we know about high path influenza in mammals, current H5N1 variant has spilled into numerous wild mammals, terrestrial and marine. Uh, a lot of the transmission in, in terrestrial mammals appears to be a predator-prey sort of relationship where they're ingesting a sick animal, but it's not as clear with the marine environment. So it's probably the case that that is an environmental transmission or there's another kind of indirect link that's happening there, but it's not that the animals are ingesting the birds. It, and they could be, it happens once in a while that a seal will eat a bird, but it's not one of their main diet choices. So it seems unlikely at the level that we've seen it. Uh, there's limited evidence that there could be spread that is happening within the seals, but it's still very much uh, on the, the early days to be able to make any firm conclusions about that. There was, however, something that is making a, a big splash in the news right now that perhaps some people on this call have heard about um, evidence for transmission within mink, farmed mink in Spain. So that does seem to be a case that is showing that transmission can happen within mammals. All right, so to wrap up then, what are the remaining questions that we still want to address um, ourselves and just as a field more broadly? And this question of who's sharing virus and how. So this is one of the really big ones that we would like to get at. So is it coming from birds individually into mammals? or is it transmitting within mammals? And that has really important implications, again, for not only wildlife, but for human health. So that's something that we um, really wanna try to get to, to the bottom of. The other thing that I think is incredibly interesting is why is this variant of high path so different? So uh, we mentioned in the, in the past, it has been primarily in poultry where you see disease and it's either asymptomatic in ducks or other species, or you don't see it really in other species. But this has been just rampant in all of these avian species and going into mammalian species. So why? Um, and that is something that us and several other people are pursuing to try to get a better idea of what is it that's different about this form of virus. And then also just looking at the seals, there's a lot of places around the globe where there is high path influenza in birds that overlap with habitat with seals. We've only seen it in the North Atlantic so far. There's also, also in Canada, I didn't mention, um, just above us. So in the Atlantic Canada, they have also had um, seals that have been infected with high path. So what is it about this region? Is it because we have that unique form that is circulating here? Is it something about the host? Is it the species that we have that congregate here or the way that they, they overlap? Or is it something external? Is it something abiotic? Does it have something to do with, with our climate or with contaminants that are in the environment that are impacting the way that the virus is uh, having an impact on the species? 
So then uh, the things to watch for, again, are trying to figure out what is going on with all those different factors. And we'll be continuing to watch for additional spillover events that might be happening into other species, potentially expanding also into the Pacific. We haven't seen a whole lot of spillover that has happened there yet, but I'm keeping an eye on that and looking for those adaptations that may allow for um, more pronounced transmission within mammalian species. So with that, this kind of work, especially there is a massive number of people that contribute to all of these efforts. And it is, it is literally not possible to put everybody's names on here that have been um, huge contributors. So I'm hoping that I'm representing at least all of the different amazing organizations and groups that have helped to contribute to all of this work. Um, and then a very special thank you to the Linda Loring Foundation and uh, the Science Club. And I'm happy to, to discuss any of this further and take any further talks. Uh, any further talks? Any further questions? Thank you, Wendy, so much. Um, I just want to thank you so much. You did such a fantastic job of really explaining and walking us through. Um, you are a natural outreach. Um, <laughs> if this was just really great, and I, um, I, you. I think um, you know, I I didn't mention at the beginning too, sign kind of that nature of Science Pub, right? When we first started. All those years ago, we used to be in a bar and it was, you know, that relaxed atmosphere. Um, so I do encourage people, um, you know, with Science Pub, we want you to ask questions. We want you to think of, there's no stupid questions. I truly believe that in general in life, but certainly in Science Pub, we want you to, um, you know, ask questions. What's on your mind? Um, I am going to field some of these questions. Let's see. So feel free. Anyone, any questions, you can put them either in the the Q&A part, or there's a chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we do have one question. Um, is there anything new in backyard chicken flocks that we should worry about here? So um, yeah, do you have any recommendations for those with backyard flocks? So being mindful of biosecurity continues to be very important. Um, there continues to be ongoing outbreaks that are happening in backyard flocks. That are across the country and that didn't quiet down um so in talking to people from usda they they expected that with the summer heat that would basically kill a lot of the virus and a lot of that would quiet it it, it never did so it has continued to be an issue with backyard flocks this whole time um and we're seeing numbers that are starting to come up again uh, again as we're, we're coming through the winter so just being very mindful of trying to limit interactions between poultry and wild birds for sure is an important one. And then being mindful of your own, um, your own biosecurity measures of you know, washing your hands after you handle a bird. And if you're um, you know, having a specific pair of shoes that you wear out when you're going to the coop and not and limiting how much you're, you're tracking around in other places. So those sorts of things are, are the way to go. Great, thank you. Um, you know, Wendy, as a dog owner myself, and we have all these beautiful ponds here around Nantucket, I know that, you know, waterfowl, is, I mean, any wild bird, as we're seeing, there's so many different species affected, but especially waterfowl, and with two labs that love to run in the water at all times of year, have there been any, like, dogs or, you know, other, I would say other pets, but basically, have dogs been affected with this disease? Not that has been confirmed as far as domestic dogs um, have been coyotes. So right. it there's every reason to think that they can be. Um, and there, so dogs also, so there's a, a form of influenza H3N8 that's referred to sometimes as canine influenza, um, even though it impacts a huge number of species, but dogs can get influenza <laughs> and they can get human influenza, the H3N2. So they can get influenza just broadly, but there's every reason to think that they will be susceptible to the high path influenza as well. So again, with the biosecurity, I think it continues. It's always important to try to, to limit the interaction between a domestic animal and a wild animal, but it's extra important now. Um, while I am waiting for a few more questions, um, our uh, my coworker, Seth Engelborg, he wasn't able to attend tonight because he has another meeting, but he um, gave me a list of questions. Some, a few of which you answered during your talk, but one of them was, um, you sort of alluded to at the end that what are the most or what do you see as the most important priorities for research moving forward? Is it more the genetic side, which you alluded to more of the surveillance pieces? 
tracking the different pathways, you know, kind of what are some of those future research um, needs? Yeah, so certainly some of the ones that I mentioned are, are top on my priority list of trying to understand what it is that's different about this virus that is allowing it to have such a huge impact on this broad range of species, avian and mammalian. So we don't typically see this sort of impact in other avian species even. So trying to understand the, the genetics of what is different that is leading to, to that outcome try to understand whether or not mammalian transmission is actually happening and watching closely for the possibility that that could happen. Um, but another one that I didn't allude to, I'm gonna go out on a little bit of a limb here. So we we're talking about the fact that influenza has this amazing trick that it's able to swap around its genetic material. There is kind of the tip of the iceberg of variants that we tend to see in mammals, that we tend to see in humans. The thing that myself and several others have, have always been concerned about or watched for or wondered about is you have this huge array of variation that exists out there in nature. And if you need those, those, those surface pieces, the, the, the right pieces of the Velcro to be able to stick to human cells and be able to infect a human, but there's all these other internal parts that could be mixing and reassorting as this virus is going rampant through the ecosystem. And if you get these crazy reassortments that are happening and those then are able to come into a new host like us, what does that potentially mean for how our immune systems are able to handle it and how we're able to respond? Um, and the going out on a limb part is the, the transmission that, that was observed in the mink in Spain going through that farm there were some internal parts of that virus that actually came from H13 versions of the virus that are typically associated only with gulls. So you see that virus with gulls and with shorebirds, and really you never see it with anything else. But now there are some internal pieces of that virus that have tucked themselves in to this high path influenza that went into the mink farm and was able to cause death in the mink in that setting. So as all of those sort of um, possibilities unfold. I think that's something that we really need to keep a close eye on and just doing surveillance and saying positive, positive, negative, negative isn't enough. We need to actually be getting those viruses and looking at that sequence and looking for what is what's under the hood and trying to better understand what we need to prepare for. Um, thank you. I know it's like, now I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> um, uh, Posey asked a follow-up question. She had asked the um, backyard chicken flat question. Um, just, you know, her personal experience of seeing dead birds on the beach um, along the South Shore, and if you had any thoughts. And I and I will add to, this is the time of year we see a lot of, you know, every year, no matter what, without, even without the H1N1, um, we're seeing, or not H1N1, whatever. Um, we're, we're seeing dead birds, eiders, and things on the beaches too. So keeping that in mind as well. Do you have any thoughts or advice for people that find things? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of questions that come up about, um, you know, there's there's a heightened awareness as you're thinking about H5 being in the area, high path being in the area. So there's a lot of questions that come up about what are the background levels of mortality that, that exist in a given species. And as you have storm events and um, you know, food stress and all of those other things that can lead to, to the animals um, not surviving. And it's the background information, the baseline data is somewhat spotty. So it can be a little kind of a, a little fire field trying to come up with what looks like normal. Um, but with all that said, there is a solid possibility that high path is, is part of the issue if you're seeing a bunch of dead birds. We have seen very consistently, until recently, we saw very consistently until recently, the, the neurology. So if you're also, if you're seeing birds, if you're seeing dead birds, but if you're seeing birds that are, are flopping around in the water or can't hold their head up, or they're going around in circles, there are a lot of other things I have since learned because my background was not in, in clinical features of wild animals, but I taken a crash course this past year. There's a lot of things that cause neurology in birds, as it turns out, one of which is high path, but it has almost been without exception that high path has neurology. 
So if the birds are otherwise seeming fine in the area, those ones, there's a reasonably good chance that they're not impacted. It is important to say though, again, that biosecurity. So with that predator prey relationship, you really want to limit your dogs having any access to a dead bird. So if you're hiking along a trail and there are several dead birds, don't put yourself at risk by, by handling the birds, but if it's possible to kind of kick it off of the trail and kind of get it a little bit out of the, the way, or if it's possible to bury it, depending on what sort of resources you have available, if you can kind of take it out of the food chain, then that is, is a, a, a helpful way to go, but don't put yourself at risk to, to do so. I think that's a great point. And I remember, you know, early on seeing the num like the species that were affected and so many of the birds were large birds, right? And so those are the things we would notice as acting awkwardly, like a, like, well, we, you know, from what you said, we know that, you know, um, the ducks and geese and those kinds of things were being affected early on, but also seeing a goose act awkwardly on the shore is much more obvious than a chickadee or like a songbird. So, um, you know, I was interested when you put up the list of the different bird species, so many of them are like the raptors or the charismatic bigger birds. Um, do you think that that is the case of observer and, you know, finding those birds more um, or, you know, what is the, the transmission or the known infection rate for some of the passerines, the smaller birds? Generally speaking, you don't see a whole lot of influenza in the passerines. So the, the songbirds are largely not affected by, by influenza in general or by high path. Um, and that has largely been the case, even as we've seen this huge species diversity with this current strain of influenza. I do say that with a little bit of a grain of salt. So crows, so you don't know, think of those as a songbird, but they are passerines. So the crows have been um, pretty heavily impacted. There have been a lot of crows that have come up positive. Um, there's starting to be a few scattered reports of songbirds that are high path positive. Not many. It's um, and in part that might be observer bias, but one of the fantastic things about the partnerships of of working with the the wildlife responders and the rehab facilities is is it is a a more indiscriminate sweep of what's there. So if we're screening, we're looking at everything, regardless of what it is, that, it, that includes some of those songbirds and they're not coming up as positive. So at least within our region, um, there haven't been, uh, but there have been a few small scattered reports here and there. Thanks. Um, and we're coming up on time, but I know um, Kate just put in the um, Q&A um, a link to the state reporting form for dead birds. Um, and I know on Nantucket, we've had um, a group of people, including the Lindelore Nature Foundation, Offshore, and um, Nisha, and, you know, a group of people who are, you know, I wouldn't say they're, they're not trained in wildlife rehab, but they are, there's kind of like a chain of people that are, um, can help respond to some of these. Um, if there are certain species that we do want samples from, um, we people may take samples, but sometimes I think a lot of the recommendations are, you know, like you said, Wendy, keep, take it out of the food chain if possible. But the number one thing is always like, don't touch it and leave it, um, you know, and like you said, um, keep keeping the, uh, the dogs and things out of, out of the um, way. We're fortunate on Nantucket in a way that we don't have the same mammal um, chain. We like all those mammals that you posted, the foxes, the coyotes, possums, skunks. Um, so we don't have those mammals to be affected in the food chain, but we are a dog friendly island. So that is, you know, the bigger concern. Yeah, and it's, it's worth saying that the ultimately safety is definitely the number one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in most cases, if you're out for an evening stroll along the beach, you don't have gloves and personal protective equipment with you. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be messing with a dead bird. It's it's not safe for you. But if there is the opportunity to report it in, and there are places that you know some of the stranding um, wildlife responders are able to, it is worth reporting that in. Again, because of what I was mentioning about really wanting to try to understand what's going on under the hood, so it it will. It could be advantageous to, to be able to try to pull virus off of, you know, even if it's, it's 
you know, number 1200 dead gull, it's, you know, people might be like, well, it's another dead gull from high path, but maybe there's something different about that virus that was on that gull that is important for us to, to watch for. Great. Well, just so everybody's on the call now or on the, on the zoom now, um, we're going to send a follow-up email to everyone usually after this. And I will, um, send links for what the recommendation is. I apologize. I don't have it right now for Nantucket, um, who the first response is. Um, you know, we have some articles from the summertime, but I want to check in with our group um, now that it's winter, like what the best um, practice is if you're on Nantucket specifically. So I will be sending that out to everyone. Um, well, Wendy, I want to thank you again so much for joining us tonight. This was a really informative and um, I'm really, you know, thankful also that we recorded it and we'll be able to share um, more broadly. If anybody has any follow-up questions, um, you can, you know, feel free to email me um, or contact the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation and we can get you in touch with Wendy as well. All right, thank you so much. And don't be shy about reaching out. Great, thanks so much, Wendy. Thank you. I'm gonna stop recording.